Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is December 12th, 2018, and uh, we are very excited to bring back on our show Bishop uh, Bill Real and podcaster Bill Real. He is the host of Mormon Discussions Podcast. He's been doing that for several years. We've featured that work um, on Mormon Stories in the past. Uh, I think I feel a little bit of pride in helping discover Bill Real in the sense that I brought him on Mormon Stories Podcast while he was a sitting bishop. We've had him on a few times since then. In some ways, Bill Real filled the gap uh, when Mormon when I got excommunicated and when Mormon Stories uh, probably turned a little bit more critical and a little bit less objective as a, as a result of my own issues and my own journey. Uh, Bishop Bill Real filled that hole with his Mormon Discussions podcast and for many years led a podcast that he subtitled Faith Seeking Understanding, where he sought to be that moderate, faithful voice uh, within Mormonism. And he did that for many years, but of course had his own journey of uh, his own faith journey that that uh, many of us have, where it's just harder and harder to fill that role, I think, when you see the pain and the difficulty um, that so many experience as a result of Mormonism. And and so as Bill's uh, podcast became a little bit more edgy, a little bit more strident, a little bit more critical, uh, he ended up receiving a very similar fate, as did I, which was receiving a letter um, in uh, in the winter of 2018, summoning him to a disciplinary council. We've already covered uh, you know that in our in episode a few episodes back on Mormon Stories podcast. He ended up calling out Elder Holland for several dishonest statements that he's made publicly, um, and he, he chose to title it "Liar, Liar, Pants on Fire." Um, but uh, but the the evidence was there that Elder Holland has been um, deceiving or making dishonest statements. So it wasn't that he made that statement without support, uh, and so uh, promptly thereafter he received the letter for his disciplinary council, um, which was held. What was the date of your disciplinary council, Bill? Uh, November 27th. November 27th. And so uh, we we covered that in depth on Mormon Stories podcast. But what we like to do is shine a big fat spotlight on disciplinary councils, uh, having been through one myself and having covered and attended several others. We find them to be medieval. We find them to be barbaric. We find them to be spiritually abusive. And of course, we know that Dr. Gina Colvin from New Zealand, the wonderful podcaster for uh, a Thoughtful Faith podcast, uh, is also set to be excommunicated. I believe that date is December 20th. So in 10 short days, Dr. Gina Colvin will also be excommunicated. And of course, this is all followed by Sam Young, who is excommunicated, uh, Bishop Sam Young for trying to uh, protect LDS children. Um, and of course, we know about others, including Jeremy Reynolds, Kate Kelly, Marisa and Carson Calderwood, um, Rock Waterman, Denver Snuffer, and several others in the past several years who have been excommunicated, all for telling the truth, all for fighting for uh, marginalized or disadvantaged groups uh, within Mormonism. Uh, and so we're going to keep shining a spotlight on these excommunications until the church stops them. We recognize the church's right to excommunicate people, but we think it's damaging and barbaric and spiritually abusive, so we're going to keep doing it. So uh, without any further ado, uh, uh, Bishop Bill Real. Uh, oh, one last thing. We want to welcome all our Facebook Live listeners who are joining us. We have 160 people now joining us. If any of you who are listening want to uh, help Bill Real, help Mormon Stories Podcast, and help the cause that we're all fighting for, we would welcome you now to please share uh, this video on your Facebook feeds, on your, on your desktops, on your walls, um, in groups that you're a member of, it would be great to get that uh, live viewing number up to three or 400. And it would be great to get some believing Mormons on uh, because in so many ways, there are audience. We just hope to build more awareness about the church, uh, its leadership, and uh, help improve the church by shining a spotlight on the things that it needs to improve. So if you're willing, please do share right now this feed. And also please share your comments and questions um, in the chat group, because we really want uh, to make this interactive and really, really want to incorporate your comments and feedback. What we're going to be doing during this episode is 
interviewing Bill about uh, the moments leading up to his disciplinary council, the days and hours leading up to his disciplinary council. Then we're going to actually play the recording of his disciplinary council because uh, um, this disciplinary council was recorded and uh, and we'll be pausing it throughout that um, recording to, to kind of do a play-by-play -play analysis and also to let Bill comment on the disciplinary council. And then we'll, uh, we'll end that segment by allowing Bill to talk about his reactions to the disciplinary council, how he felt when he left, what the crowd was like, and then what the general reaction has been uh, to his excommunication um, and, uh, and kind of what's next for uh, Mormon Discussions podcast and for Bill Real. Uh, so without any further ado, uh, Bishop Bill Real, Bishop and ex-Mormon Bill Real, welcome back uh, to Mormon Stories Podcast. Thanks for joining us. Once a bishop, always a bishop, right? So, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, yeah, grateful for the chance to sit and talk with you. And, and again, as I said earlier, I think this is an important conversation, how disciplinary councils happen in terms of those charged with apostasy and what it means for those of us who have been through this uh, faith journey. All right. Well, um, let's begin, Bill, by just talking about the days and, and hours leading up to the disciplinary council. What was that like for you and Amanda and your family? Yeah. So again, what I said earlier, backing up maybe a couple of years, uh, smart guy, I've got really smart friends around me. And we knew that this day was coming at some point. So we had we had been talking about what that would look like for a couple of years, at least um, just knowing kind of how the other ones have gone, uh, what kind of procedural things they do in those excommunications of public voices uh, for apostasy and how we could um, I, I don't want to say like manipulate or anything, but certainly use to our advantage uh, those procedures and, and so this wasn't something that caught us by surprise. Um, my family uh, actually handled this really well. My wife and my kids disconnected from Mormonism long before I did. And uh, so they weren't as emotionally tied into this as I was. Uh, a couple of days before the disciplinary council, I started to get really emotional. I spent one morning probably for about an hour just crying. And it wasn't because my membership was coming to an end. It was because I was being flooded with messages through email and Facebook, um, instant messages on my phone, uh, text messages, things like that, where people were just saying, look, we've been listening to you for years. You've, you've represented at least a part of our story. You've saved our marriage. You've uh, helped my kids better understand me. You've helped my parents better understand me. And those messages 48 hours before the disciplinary court began coming in about once every one to three minutes and touching, I mean, deeply touching to have that many people reach out and say like, we love you and we're, we're on your side and, and this journey's our journey. Um, so got a little emotional and then it suddenly hits me like, wait a minute, they're putting on this vigil and I haven't heard anything about who's doing what. So I reached out to my friend group down here again, about 15 of us, and just said, hey, I mean, I've got, I've got all this kind of going on. Um, I don't know what's going on with the vigil, but I want to at least give you guys, you know, the heads up that that's happening, if there's any way you can help. And my friends, uh, the Bloxhams, um, Wayne Hepworth down here, uh, Chris Finnegan and Jen Finnegan, uh, Mikkel and Kelsey, uh, just good friends of mine, and just said, uh, you know, here's what's going on. And all of a sudden they kicked it into gear. They brought heaters. They brought tables for that night. They made hot cocoa. They brought donuts. They brought cider. And it allowed me to be really calm uh, through that experience, knowing that my friends were looking after the people who were outside. Uh, they, they went out of their way to listen to those folks' stories and to make them uh, make it feel important that those folks showed up. And it meant a lot to me that that's probably the most emotional part of this whole process was watching those who showed up and watching my friends take care of them. Um, I should mention too, before this uh, disciplinary court, uh, we had a dinner at uh, in the uh, upper room of Rigatti's and uh, just a pizza place here in Washington, Utah. John, you were there. There was probably about 60 of us there and it was just a fun meal, a chance to break bread with people who had been on the journey who 
had watched these excommunications take place, who knew my story and had come to watch one more. And just a quick shout out to the karaoke van group that I uh, had the pleasure of traveling with from Salt Lake down to St. George. We had a great time. And I, I'm really grateful that some people from Salt Lake were willing to make that trip to yeah. support you, Bill. That was really yeah, fun. Yeah, we had people... Yeah, we had people come as far as I think Illinois. If somebody came further, I'd love to know it. But man, to have, I think at any given time, there were about 125 people there that night and people were coming and going. So there was certainly more than that in totality. Um, but to me, that's just, just a huge show of support that was deeply touching to me and, and more importantly, um, my family, deeply touching to my wife and kids. Uh, my kids got to see... My kids got to see the effect that that this journey has on people and the value that their father has to this group. And uh, that, uh, that was just amazing. Excuse me. Yeah. Well, it was a sacred, you know, one of the things I, I really feel strongly about is that the intent of an excommunication so often is to shame. It's to publicly yeah. shame. It's to stamp this big scarlet letter because it's not about your beliefs. Uh, there are all sorts of people who are active Mormons who don't believe in the church anymore. Right. The church doesn't care about that. Right. Um, you know, of course, they would want people to believe, but, um, you know, that's not why they're excommunicating people. They're excommunicating people, um, you know, because they've reached the level of having such an impact that the church is uncomfortable with their impact. And the purpose of the excommunication is to stamp a big scarlet letter on their forehead to say they're, they're an apostate, they're dangerous, they're dirty, they're evil, they're to be shunned and stayed away from. And it's the intent is to beat you down. And something that I feel very strongly about when I saw the September 6th get excommunicated in uh, September of, 2000, of, of 1993, I saw them kind of, you know, in, in a large sense, disappear from Mormon discourse for a decade or more. Now, that, that, that's not to say that they all went silent. They still spoke out. But, um, but it, it, it had an effect of shaming them, putting a dark mark on them, and, and then silencing the discourse. And so something I feel very strongly about is that we need to turn these acts of you know the, these attempts at shaming into a celebration where disciplinary councils become not only an, an a sacrament as i think paul toscano once said i think paul toscano once called mormon excommunications the highest sacrament of mormonism in other words let's turn these things into into celebrations of courage um for people who have shown a spotlight on the church and stood for truth and for integrity. Let's make it a celebration of courage and a sacrament of love and support where we can show our love and support for these people, but also stand tall and say, yeah, you can, you can not, it's just like you, you can throw us in jail. You can beat us down, but we're not going away. We're going to stand taller and firmer than ever. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you think about that, Bill? We, we have tons of stories, and, and I say this in the disciplinary council, we have tons of stories of people who come into our church, and we, we praise them for their courage, for their bravery, for leaving Catholicism, for leaving their evangelical church, for leaving uh, whatever church it is, or maybe no church at all and coming in. And then the moment somebody on the journey of truth-seeking leaves, Every single story we tell is unhealthy. It shames, it belittles, it demeans. It makes them less than and broken. And all they did was go through the same process of asking questions, truth seeking, and looking for answers and looking for truth. Um, it's, it's how you know an unhealthy system uh, when everybody who comes in is looked at as the best thing in the world and everybody who goes out is somehow less than and broken. Yeah, another way I, I like to phrase that is that quote I heard from Thomas McConkie. And, you know, we don't like to call the church a cult, but uh, a sign of a cult is any organization that won't let you leave with your dignity intact. Yeah. Amen. And uh, so while I don't think it's constructive to use 
on this podcast to call the church a cult, I will just say that the church needs to stop this because it makes the church look cult-like when it does these sorts of things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's certainly an unhealthy mechanism. I love the comment from N.A. Johnson who writes, the church was on trial during your disciplinary council, uh, not you. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, that's a sentiment that gets conveyed each time there's disciplinary council. Okay, Bill. So we had, we had, um, we had dinner at that pizza place that night. Um, what else do you want to share about the moments leading up to the actual disciplinary council? Sure. After that, I went home with my wife, uh, a few friends gathered at my home. You were for a few minutes, John, um, just changed clothes, just kind of the group of us just talking any last minute kind of, uh, preparations, making sure that I was ready to rock and roll again. I've, again, I've got good friends around me and up until 24 hours before they're like, Hey, have you thought about this? What if they ask that? What if they do this? Um, and then as we got one day before, I said, okay, guys, uh, we got to set all that off to the side. Uh, just trust the fact that I'm, I'm a smart enough guy to walk in there and be confident. I'm good at articulating things and, and uh, let's no more suggestions. That's going to throw me off my game. So when we got back to the house and changed clothes, it was really more of just kind of like, you know, knock it out of the park. You got this. Um, and then we got in the car and headed off to uh, the stake center. And I just want to say that was another sacred moment for me to see your close, dear friends, some of whom had traveled from far away to yeah. just be there to buoy you and support you in your home. And then to have your wife and kids all there and supporting yeah. you. Another very sacred moment for me uh, to see the love that was surrounding you going into that um, event. Yeah, it. as you said earlier, this idea that you can't leave with your dignity, the way that night went... Uh, I think as we get into it, you'll see that, and, and I think you already see it, but the listeners will see that I was able to completely leave with my dignity uh, because everything happened as well as I thought it would or better. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So uh, we all hop in the cars, leave your home and travel to the, to the stake center. Yep. And so we get there Um I get out and I mean, the crowd is already uh, significant and I can already see my friends kind of in action with, uh, with donuts sitting out and the hot cocos cooking. Uh, there's Wayne, a, Wayne, I think, Hepworth, Wayne Hepworth brought those uh, gas heaters. Yeah. Like there was like six of them. And I think it was, it made, it made a huge difference because it was a cold night, which I think the church somewhat liked, you know, it's it makes it harder for people to want to be there and to stay. And the heaters I think made it bearable and, uh, uh, they were a great addition to to what was going on. And there was a good crowd already there when you showed up, right? Yeah, yeah. And there were some news agencies there. I think the Spectrum was there and maybe the St. George News, but at least the Spectrum was there. And uh, somebody had already brought microphones and had things ready to roll. Uh, I showed up. I shake some hands. I, I introduced myself to a few people. A few people introduced themselves to me. And, uh, and then uh, somebody asked me to grab the microphone and uh, for me and my wife to kind of let people know why we were, what we were thinking or what we were, what was on our minds as we were getting ready to walk in. Uh, it, and it was just a good chance to just talk to people and let them know that I recognized that my chance to go in that room in some ways was also their chance to go in that room. Uh, and that these journeys are so relationship connecting, like we all love each other and care about each other as, as we're all connected in this part of our story. Um, that I, I was aware and I wanted them to know it, that going into that room represented them as much as it did me. Um, yeah, that was, th those were nice. It was also, it was great to see Bishop Sam Young there supporting you. Yeah. He had a camera crew and, um, and, and yeah, there was a, just a huge group outside. I, I, I counted, I, I think it was somewhere between 100 and 200 people. Did you get a final count? Of how uh, big I know that. Yeah, I know that we had friends that went around at one point to count who were there at that static moment. It was 126. But again, people were coming through the night. Um, I know some of the media reported like there were a few there. Um, I, I think 126 coming and going is more than a few. But um, anyway, I thought it was a significant crowd. My impression was there was at least 200 people that came throughout the night. And uh, yeah. I was just really yeah. heartened to see that that size of a group. And I want to thank everyone who showed up for Bill. 
Yeah. And I, and I want to add, John, thank you to you and to Sam Young. I think the two of you guys being there uh, while I was inside uh, added, added to the night and made it, um, made it much more visible, I think, to the general public, which I think is the message we're trying to get, which is people watch this and look at this and see how this happens and then make up your own mind if this is okay. And it was really cool. They did this at my disciplinary council too. It's really cool that in 2018 or 2015 or whatever, you can live stream these things. So we had yeah. two or three live stream feeds going with hundreds and hundreds of people being able to participate in this event from wherever they were. That was also a very special thing. And a shout out to everyone who tuned in because that's just another way to show that support, you know, and to share those live stream feeds with everybody. You can you can just, it's just shining this huge spotlight on the church's behavior. Yeah, and I haven't actually watched those uh, front to back yet. Uh, I was kind of waiting for all of this to settle down so that I could just kind of watch those and just see it from the standpoint of who was there and who showed up and what people had to say. But um, it's amazing too, as the person going into the room, you don't get to participate in that stuff going on outside that's in support of you. So now there's a chance for that to be recorded and to be watched. Uh, I think that's amazing as well. So now I've got a chance here soon to, to sit down with my family and just kind of see uh, what some of the things were that were said and, and shared in those moments. I love it. Okay. So should we talk about uh, you going into the, to the disciplinary council? Let's do it. All so, right. so I walked in um, wife in hand. Um, Amanda, right? Her, yeah, Amanda, Amanda, she's been on this journey with me every step of the way from the moment uh, I announced to her that my shelf had come down in 2012. She has been nothing but uh, rock solid standing by my side. Um, just uh, again, I, I know that these faith journeys are messy and some people even lose relationships along the way, including their spouse. Um, and so I don't take that lightly that I was, I'm privileged in that my wife has walked side by side with me the entire way. Um, so in hand, the two of us walk into uh, the doors of the building, the a, a local PR guy, um, like the stake PR guy walks us in with us into the building and he was nice and kind. Uh, but, but he also didn't really know why exactly this was going on. Um, so we walk through the doors and I assume it's the stake executive secretary who then asks us to sit down on a sofa and then hands us uh, this letter that we're supposed to sign, which is essentially some type of an NDA, uh, non-disclosure agreement where we're going to agree not to uh, record or share the proceedings uh, that happen. And I asked him if I could take a picture with my phone. Uh, he said yes, and then he walked away. I took a picture of the phone, uh, and then signatures went on to the two lines. Uh, what, are you, what are your thoughts on the church having you sign that, that document saying you won't record? What are your thoughts on that, just so you're on the record? Yeah, so it only serves one purpose. So first off, the, what we say is it's to protect this person being charged. We don't, we don't want them incurring public ridicule. But the reality is I was trying to be fully transparent about this entire process. So it, it isn't to serve that. That's not its purpose because I welcome transparency and every bit of this being public on the, in the public record. Um, we can say like, well, you know, maybe it, it does this or maybe it does that. The reality is all that it does is serve the purpose of hurting the credibility if a recording comes out. And, and so the idea is this person agreed to do ABC and they didn't. And so look at them, don't trust their message. And, and so all it does is take the TBM or the Orthodox believer and give them something to dismiss the person being charged or to dismiss listening to the recording when, uh, when there really is no other purpose served by that. Yeah. So, so you're saying it's uh, you know, I, I kind of just feel like it's just embarrassing that in 2018, it's embarrassing for a church that bears Christ's name to be excommunicating people much less for just having thoughts or feelings that the church is uncomfortable with for speaking truth in your case, or um, for speaking their conscience in a public way. And so I just think the church doesn't want any evidence of, of this 
because it ultimately is incredibly embarrassing for them. It's also another shaming mechanism, right? So when I leave that court and we go outside and I share my version of what happened without a recording surfacing, there's no way for anybody to be sure that my side of the story is true. There's no way for anybody to be sure that how that happened in that room that night is how it happened. And so it's one more way to damage the credibility or even take away the dignity of the person that's been charged. I think the church, if it's true, it can certainly hold up to whatever conversations happen in these rooms uh, being public. And uh, for whatever reason, the church seems to seems to see that as uh, problematic for them, not for me. Yeah. Okay. So did you, what do you want to say about your thoughts around recording or not recording this? Is there anything you want to share about that? Or do you just want to not, not talk Um, about? Yeah, I can say a few things that, um, so the recording device used, I I knew that there was going to be an attempt to record that night. Um, I was aware of that. I, the recording device was not mine. Uh, I'm not the one who uh, hit the record button, who recorded it. I'm not the one who, and in fact, I didn't even know if a recording existed uh, until I left uh, the disciplinary council and discovered after that, that a recording actually uh, had worked and had taken place. Uh, So I knew that there was an attempt. I don't really want to say more than that because I think I want to keep the church on its toes, not knowing exactly how this happened. Uh, I know there were rumors out there of various things occurring, uh, and I think it plays in the favor of those who um, speak a message of the church being transparent to allow people to have as much space and room for the church to not know how these things are going on. Okay. So we won't, we won't go into the details about that. Um, yeah, my, yeah but- my perspective on the recording is kind of like a gospel topic essay. It's a little whitewashed. Um, I'm giving the <laughs> faith-promoting version. And uh, we may never know the full story by reading an essay. <laughs> All right. Um, cool. So uh, you, but you signed it. Um, signatures went on that paper, but what I would say is the guy walked away. Nobody watched those signatures go on. So I'll leave that ambiguous as well. Okay. All right. So what happened after you signed that document? Uh, after the document uh, was signed uh, in those two spots, then uh, the stake president came out. Uh, no, I shouldn't say that. The executive secretary came back to get the paper and also asked for our phones. So both of our phones went into a box with everybody else's phones uh, and got stuck into, I guess, the clerk's office. And then the stake president, as soon as we handed our phones over, the stake president came out the door, shook my hand, asked if we were ready. And I said, I'm ready. And uh, my wife and I walked into the room the room was, it's a really long room. Like if you can imagine one of these movies where there's this long business table, longer than I expected. Um, and the stake president was down way at one end, maybe 45, 50 feet away. And then on the other end of the table, there was nobody and everybody took sides of the table. The counselors in the stake presidency were next to the stake president on the end. Uh, the stake high council was along the sides. And at the end, at the, head, at the other head of the table, the end of the table, it was completely empty. And then 10 foot back were these two chairs with a table with a bunch of waters. And they asked us to sit in those chairs, um, which, which we did for the moment, but it was hard to hear the stake president. So just as he begins to start the council, my wife and I ask, like, this is silly. Why are we way over here? Do you guys mind if we sit at the other end of this table? And they said, no, no problem. And so we scooted our chairs up uh, and then the court began. Okay. And uh, what's it, what does it feel like? So there were 15, 16 men in the room? Yeah, I didn't know a single one of them except for the stake president. And then three of the high councilmen couldn't be there. So there were substitutes for them. And one of them was my bishop, who I've met one time. And then my stake president, who I've met twice. And then every other man in that room, I, I didn't know them. They were, they were complete strangers to me and my wife. Okay. And how did that feel? Um, I think in most situations that would be a little nerve wracking, but again, I don't know what it was, but I was as calm as could be uh, through this, through this thing. So I, no big deal. Like I knew that I had a chance. There were these men and my gut told me that they don't know the story of Mormonism. uh, And here was my, my last chance uh, as an insider 
to tell these guys uh, the things they had no clue about. And so did you have a goal going in? Um, yeah, to, to build, to do what missionaries always do, which is to build a relationship of trust. Uh, so I do that in the beginning to lay out the data, to lay out the messiness and to do it in a way that they are overwhelmed by it. And we can get into at some point, I want to make sure we cover talking about the intention of bringing people's shelves down. Um, because on, on some level, that's absolutely my motive. Um, and, and I don't mean it in a bad way. And I hope we can get to that. I want to kind of talk about that as we close. Um, but to essentially lay out the data in a way that these guys have to recognize that I've read more than them. I knew more than them. Uh, and what I knew, what I knew was important to the discussion to the point where it was going to change how they saw the church. And I think that's the fact. I think you lay out the truth of Mormonism in its full scope. That data is compelling to the believer to have to change something or maybe change everything. Okay. So uh, what do you want to tell us about kind of how the meeting begins? How do they begin the meeting? Yeah. So my stake president uh, stands up. He announces that there's three substitutes there. He points those men out. Um, he then reads a letter and his hands are shaking. You can tell how nervous he is. He's, he's way more nervous than I am. Uh, and this has been hard on him. And I, and I don't take that lightly. I, I get that these processes on the leaders that have to carry them out uh, is emotionally traumatic. There's trauma inflicted on these guys too. Um, and so while I'm not happy with some of the ways in which that man acted, uh, I also recognize that he's also a victim in this process. Um, he's shaking, he's reading a letter and his letter essentially says, and what's uh, his name? Tell if you want to share. Sure. Emerson Carnavali. Uh, so president Carnavali. And uh, as he reads this letter, this letter essentially says, you know, Bill, I'm grateful for the chance that I've had to meet you and Amanda to get to know you to have gotten to know your kids a little bit. Um, you, you have always been honest. You've, you've had questions. Uh, you've always had integrity. Uh, I've had lots of people write me who are listeners to you. I've had people from your old ward in Ohio that you served as a bishop, write me and speak highly of your integrity and your honesty. Um, I'm not going to take any of that away from you tonight. Uh, I just want everybody in this room to know that you are an honorable person uh, and that your family is a good family. And, and that's the letter down. And then he announces uh, that the council is going to begin. Uh, they turn it over to one of the high councilmen who's nearby me to give the opening prayer. Um, when the opening prayer is done, then the guy, the president, take president, president Carnavali reads the charges and the charges are essentially that I have acted in a way that's unbecoming a member of the church and that I have worked against the church and its leaders. And then he presents the evidence. He lays out maybe six or seven pieces of evidence. The main ones are uh, Elder Holland with the liar, liar stamp on it from, and then the episode, obviously liar, liar, pants on fire. The uh, Elder Ballard saying that we'd never hidden anything uh, the post that I talk about that with a stamp of liar on top of him, uh, a post about Elder Oaks not seeing Jesus. But the problem there is I have Elder Oaks' own words claiming that he's never seen any spiritual heavenly messenger. Um, and he's done that on two occasions. It was the Boise rescue. And then it was another one where uh, he was talking to a young lady who asked if he had ever had an Alma experience. And he said that he had not, and he didn't know any of his brethren among the first presidents here of the 12 uh, who had had an Elma experience either, and that his witness wasn't gained in that way. Um, so again, I don't, I don't understand the charge because it's the leader who's saying it, and I'm just, I'm just double, doubling up the verification of what Elder Oaks has already said. Um, and then he mentioned my Mythical Jesus podcast, but he never said what it was there. Uh, and then there were a couple of other posts, but they were obvious from his own conversation around them to not be as significant as the Oaks, Ballard, and Holland uh, Facebook post. Nothing in the podcast, by the way, really. Um, the podcast really isn't mentioned at all. I think part of it is these guys don't listen to that. Uh, nobody wants to spend time listening to hours and hours of audio. The easiest way for them to catch you is just to have a Facebook post. Um, so nobody's really going to take the time, I think, to dive into these, these MP3 files 
as, as evidence of the charges, it's just much easier for them to get a Facebook post. So if you had to summarize what you were being uh, tried for, you know, the, you, you just listed them, but, but how would you summarize why they're excommunicating you according to what they said? Uh, telling the truth abrasively would be what, what about, I would. About, about who? About Elder Holland being dishonest, about Elder Ballard about, being dishonest. About church about, leaders, right? Yeah, and about Elder Oaks not really talking to heavenly messengers. And, you know, you could argue that's, that's part of our temple recommend, that's part of our um, temple covenants, right? Don't speak evil of the Lord's anointed. You have been speaking, from their perspective, is it fair to say you've been speaking evil of the Lord's anointed? Uh, sure, but isn't it, isn't it interesting when the system gets to be judge, jury, ed, executioner, as well as the legislators on, on the entire process? Well, I would just highlight, have you been speaking evil of them or have you been speaking the truth about yeah, them? Yeah, and the question becomes whether the truth is evil. Um, and they would obviously say it is, and the rest of us would look at it and go, that's nonsense. If you can't call truth, I mean, if you can't, and somebody pointed this out, if we were back in Jesus's day and we raise a hand and go, hey, wait a minute, that Judas Iscariot guy, that, guy's, that guy looks a little fishy and he looks like he's going to betray the Savior. And they go, yeah, you can't say that. That seems kind of ridiculous, uh, but that's the system we're in. Yeah. So how long were, his, the, were the charges that he read against you? Uh, maybe, maybe seven, eight minutes, not long. Super short, right? Yeah, doesn't take long to say, hey, you put this post out, here's what you said. You put this post out, here's what you said. Um, and, and just leave it at that. And then once he closed that out, uh, he said, okay, you've got 60 minutes. Um, he had originally told me between 40 and 60 and I, uh, pleaded with him about 24 hours before the court to do me one last favor and give me the full 60 minutes that he's offering. And he said he would. So he says, you've got 60 minutes and, uh, your wife would take up whatever portion of that you want. So you can choose when she speaks my wife is kind of a, an introvert when it comes to public speaking. So I said, if you want to go last, I'll try to take up maybe 50, 55 minutes. And if you want to say a few things at the end, which was more than okay with her, I don't want anybody to feel like, um, I, 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 there's always this worry, like to give her as much space as possible to share her part of the story too. And, and she's just not, she's not one to, to want to take up a ton of time and be speaking in front of a bunch of strangers. So uh, she said she'd go last, and at that point, I uh, took up the first 50, 55 minutes talking. A shout-out to uh, Sarah Newcomb, a listener. She runs the Lamanite Truth uh, podcast. She made it the point that it's also part of our temple covenants to be honest in our dealings with our fellow men, <laughs> in addition right. to not speaking evil of the Lord's anointed. <laughs> right. We have to recognize we're in a system where if an apostle is a liar, that's okay, that goes unchecked and a lay member calling out the apostle for lying that is punishable. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, thanks again to all our listeners. We have 256 people who have joined us. I see 23 shares so far. So a huge thanks to everyone who's shared this interview so far. I'd love to get that up to 50. So if any of you are listening right now and are willing to share um, this interview on your Facebook walls, in Facebook groups, Twitter, Instagram, wherever you can, email. We would love to get uh, as many um, Mormons listening to this interview as possible. So thanks to everyone who shared so far. Uh, the rest of you, please share if you're willing. I'd love to get 300, 400 live viewers and uh, 50 shares if possible. All right. So without any further ado, Bill, what we're going to do now is we're going to play your um, your own testimony that's been recorded. Um, the, you know, a warning that it's a scratchy recording, so you're going to hear some scratches all throughout it, but try and focus on the substance and, and the content of, um, of the interview listeners. And then what we're going to do is Bill, Bill and I are going to pause this recording at various points, and we're going to offer some um, commentary. Does that sound all right, Bill? Sounds awesome. Let's do it. All right. So without any further ado, listeners, uh, this is Bill Reel's um, sort of a personal, what do you call it? A, a testimony? What do you call it, Bill? Witness? Man, I, um, Bill I just Reel's wanted to, witness. 
I just wanted to tell them what I discovered, what, I, what my journey looked like and what it was I discovered and why it was I had to be true to the things I discovered. And then, Bill, you stop me anytime you want to make a comment, okay? Okay, let's do it. Okay, here we go. So first off, during the prayer, thank you. The prayer mentioned, like, being open to listening. And when I've heard about these disciplinary courts in the past, people turn to pretend to put their heads down and not pay attention. And I just ask that you give me 60 minutes of listening. And when, you're, and when we're done, if, if you feel like I'm, I'm an apostate, great. Then excommunicate me and, and so be it. Um, but I hope that you'll listen. Because my story, in some ways, is your story. So when I was uh, 17 years old, I found the church. And it was the most beautiful thing in the world. I was using drugs, I was making bad choices, I was shoplifting, and I discovered Mormonism, and it was gorgeous. And it was like it picked me up off of one path and it set me down on another, and it changed my life. So I'm a 17-year-old kid and I joined the church, and I'm committed, I'm both feet in. Uh, first calling I served in was an assistant ward mission leader, then I was a secretary in the Elders Quorum Presidency immediately following. I was a counselor in the Elders Quorum Presidency, I was the Elders Quorum President, I was a, bishop, or a, a counselor in the bishopric, and by 29 years old I served as a bishop in the Sandusky Ward in Ohio, a Midwestern Ward, about 120 attending, um, small ward, good people. And, and the trouble is that when we're in a religious system, we, we struggle to recognize if our system has any issues because we tend to listen to the authorities of our tribe and we're skeptical of anything that comes from outside our tribe. And so tonight I hope to share with you a little bit of our history so that you can understand where I'm coming from. And then once I've said my piece, feel free to, again, do whatever needs to be done. Um, when I was 32 years old, I was halfway through serving as a bishop and I had a faith crisis. And my faith crisis came because from the time I was 17 until that 32 years old, I was reading everything about Mormonism. I was reading about its history from faithful sources. I was reading from critical sources. I was going back to the original source material. And I simply wanted to know Mormonism inside and out. And as I started to discover some issues, um, I, I found faithful answers that worked, but they only worked if you understood the issue at a surface level. And then once you understood the issue, you realized it became way more complicated than the church let on it being. So let me share a couple things. First, we like so to stop there. Joseph Smith dabbled in treasure digging. And okay, most of us yeah. in this room, maybe don't yeah, even let's stop there. Okay, go ahead, Bill. So a few things. One was that the, the high councilman who gave the opening prayer, he was real specific about everybody in that room listening and paying attention and giving a chance for them to hear this guy they didn't know. So I wanted to play on that I, because I had heard from others that these men tend to tune out these disciplinary counsel. They tend to just look down, not pay attention. And so I thought, like, let me play on the fact that this high councilman now just prayed, which they're going to take uber seriously. This high councilman just prayed for them to pay attention. So I just wanted to remind him of what he had prayed for and what he had said so that, um, so that they would listen. And they did. Throughout the entire time we're in that room, they are all looking at me intently. Uh, they're all looking to, to pay attention, and they're, and they're listening. I, I saw very little of people tuning me out. There were maybe one or two guys who kind of did that with their body language. Everybody else seemed to be paying attention. Uh, I tried to tell them my story briefly. I didn't want to take up a lot of time with it, but I wanted them to sense that I had done the Mormon thing the way they had done it, and maybe even, maybe even more deeply than they had done it. So I wanted them to have that kind of connection uh, to me as one of them. I, I needed to be seen, in a sense, as an insider. Um, I wanted them to, I spoke for just a moment about human development and how we see tribes, and I didn't talk about Mormonism. I talked about a tribe and, and what it's like to believe inside a tribe and what it's like to believe outside a tribe. I wanted them to at least on some surface level sense uh, insider, outsider dynamics. And then I told them about my faith crisis, and I wanted them to be clear that my faith crisis came because I read more than them. I read too much. I read everything, uh, and I wanted them to feel that. And then lastly, my last thing before I go into start sharing the history, which is about to happen, um, I wanted to make sure they were clear that there are faithful answers out there but often we accept those faithful answers immediately and then we dismiss the criticism once we know there are faithful answers in existence. 
but that if we dive into those faithful answers, look at all the evidence, go back to the sources, read as much as we can, we learn pretty quickly that those faithful answers fall short. They're not satisfactory. They're the less reasonable, less logical, less plausible way to put this together. And after having done that really quickly, now I'm ready to start laying out the history. And I'll just say, I, I, I get why you said that. Uh, one of the most heartbreaking things about my disciplinary council was that I brought five witnesses. I brought my dad, my mom, my brother, Joel, uh, Bill Bradshaw, and then a member of my ward, Mike Huband. And um, they gave these heartfelt pleas uh, on my behalf that were very moving, and they wept. And it was so disheartening to look around the room and see both the, the state presidency uh, members, but also the state high council, just kind of like looking at their watch, staring off at the walls, uh, doing what psychologically humans have to do when they're um, when they're engaging in a emotionally, psychologically, socially violent act. You have to dehumanize the people involved, um, or, or otherwise you have to deal with the cognitive dissonance of being complicit in that violence. And so a very common human reaction is just to disconnect emotionally and to tune out. And that's what so many of the, everyone in the room uh, for my disp disciplinary council did. And so I think that was really smart of you to say, hey, I deserve your respect and your attention. And, and just can you bear with me one hour? <laughs> that's the least yeah. you can do. <laughs> yeah. And we had talked about, do I want to have witnesses? And again, surrounded by smart friends, we had talked about, we've watched these other ones happen. Jeremy Runnels, we, we you know, knew how yours had gone down. You're given a limited amount of time. And if you have witnesses, they take up that time. It's not like you get an hour and then the witnesses can each speak for five minutes. Whatever witnesses you call, whatever time they utilize, uh, it takes up uh, part of the time you were given. And so tr strategically, it made no sense because I already had heard you say that if you have witnesses, I mean, they tune them out, they're not looking. I felt like the best use of this time, having watched folks like you go before, was to use it all to tell them my story. Um, and so again, I think it worked because they were paying, uh, they were paying attention intently uh, throughout this entire thing. That's great. I'm glad you had that uh, level of respect because you certainly deserve that given what you were going through. Yeah. All right, let's continue the audio. Um, of Bill Reel's uh, final witness during his excommunication. First, we like to talk about Joseph Smith dabbled in treasure digging, and most of us in this room maybe don't even know what that is. Joseph Smith in 1819, and, and again, I, I don't want you to take my word for it. If something I say tonight makes you uncomfortable, go look it up. Go to the original sources, read both sides, and make up your own mind. In 1819, a year before the first vision, Joseph Smith is 13 years old, and he borrows a seer stone from Sally Chase. Sally Chase is a town scryer. She takes her stone, she looks at it, and she tells other people in the town where their lost items are. Okay? In 1819, Joseph borrows that stone, he looks into it, and he's told where his own seer stone is. And he's told it's 150 miles away, that's what he alleges. So he disappears, he comes back, and now he has a white translucent stone. Um, in 1823, while digging a well on the Willard Chase property, he finds a second stone. It's the one the church has recently talked about, egg-shaped. The church has had that stone in its possession all along. But my gut tells me if we went around the room and we talked about what story each of you grew up with in terms of the Book of Mormon translation, each of you would say there were Nephite spectacles buried in a box, and that's what Joseph Smith used. The church only recently, because we live in an internet age, feels compelled to now tell us a fuller story. That stone was in their possession, was used to bless the Manti Temple. So in 18, uh, 20, sorry, 1823, he gets that second seer stone. A money digger in, or a treasure digger is somebody who claims to know where buried treasures are. Joseph Smith would get people in the town to pay him money. He would take his seer stone, put it in a hat, bury his face into it, excluding all light, and then he would tell people where Spanish treasure was buried. The trouble was he never found it. He'd get paid, he'd tell them where to dig, and as they dug a hole, he would say, oh, it's slipped further into the earth. It's gone. 
he scammed people. And we don't want to hear that because we like to set our prophet up on a pedestal. But it's more than that. When you understand treasure digging, you understand that Joseph Smith told people that there was buried treasure in hills protected by guardian spirits using a seer stone, which also represents, too, a similar story, right? Moroni in the gold plates, buried in a hill. Moroni's the guardian spirit, and he uses a seer stone. We don't talk about that history because it's not faith-promoting. The first vision. My guess is if I went around the room, we all know the story. Okay. During this time of great excitement. Okay, yes. Go ahead, Bill. So I, I make three data mistakes in, in, the, uh, in the presentation. And one of them was that Joseph's second seer stone comes in 1822. You'll notice later, the other one is I'm thinking of Helen Mark Kimball, but I mentioned Elgar instead being 14 years old. She's actually at least 16 years old, maybe even older, depending on the debate about the dates. And then the other one was, um, I say that suicide is not only the, the largest, Utah is not only the highest suicide rate, but also the fastest growing. I think it is the highest, but I think it turns out it's maybe the fifth fastest growing uh, in the country. So I think those are minor details in the whole uh, go of this presentation, but at least to acknowledge, like, I didn't do this perfectly. There were a couple of little errors that happened. Um, as I go into treasure digging, I hope you notice I'm always trying to speak in layman's terms. I'll throw out the scholarly term, the scryer or, or money digger, but members don't know what those things mean. They don't understand those words. So you always have to stop and then retell the story in layman's terms. Um, I think, again, I've got a lot of flaws and shadows. We can, we can do that episode sometime if you want, but <laughs> one of my gifts is to speak in ways that people commonly understand, maybe colloquially. Um, so that was one of the things I'm always trying to do is make sure that I speak in a way that they know what I'm talking about, that I'm making connections in their brains to things they can relate to. The big thing with treasure digging, and I think it's the reason the church never really wanted to talk about the seer stone, um, is because when you start talking about seer stones, you have to start talking about where did they come from. And when you talk about where they came from, you have to go back to Joseph's practice of treasure digging. As a Mormon, the only quote you really learn in the correlated material is that Joseph, you know, got paid $14 a month. It wasn't very profitable, and he gave it up really quickly. That's not true. There were 17 treasure dig spots in the Palmyra area, according to Dan Vogel. Uh, it was significant. And these were not like six-foot holes in the ground like a well. These were digging caves into the sides of hills. Uh, some of these caves still exist. You can go onto Google and look up images and they are, uh, these holes in the, in the side of hills are significant where 15 people could walk into them at once. Um, I wanted people, I wanted those guys in that room, I wanted them to understand that what treasure digging was, gold treasures buried in hills, protected by guardian spirits with the use of a seer stone was no different than the Moroni story for them to sense that there was already some little crack in what they had been told. Uh, and that's kind of what I was doing when I laid out the treasure digging and the scrying. Yeah, it's super important because we, we tend to think, oh, well, Joseph had those silly little treasure digging years, but then he got righteous and faithful and created the Book of Mormon. But the truth is the Book of Mormon springs out of the treasure digging. And it was very much just a, an extension and a continuation, including the stories of, of an angel Moroni visiting um, or an angel Nephi, depending on which version you're talking about and visiting three times. That's all, that's all sort of practice that comes out of folk magic lore about visitations and native Americans and things in caves and relics like swords and peep stones and whatever Urim and Thummim plates it's all it's all an extension of of what his life had been doing for the seven years up until you know seven or ten years up until the book of mormon gets created so it's that link is is, is essential i agree yeah moroni is just one more guardian treasure guardian story it's, it's it's no it has all the facets of joseph smith's prior work as a treasure digger yeah absolutely okay should we keep going let's do it all right, let's continue with Bill Reel's uh, excommunication last witness. 
that my mind was called up to serious reflection and great uneasiness. And though my feelings were deep and often poignant, still I kept myself aloof from the various parties. We know the story. We taught it on our missions, right? Here's the trouble, though. There are four accounts of the first vision. The earliest one was written in 1832 in Joseph Smith's personal journal, written by his own hand. In that journal, he writes down that he went only to have his sins forgiven, and when he talks about being visited by supreme beings, he only mentions Jesus Christ. There was no Heavenly Father. His own handwriting. Our own scholars, when talking about the 1838 account that we use as the official account, our own scholars, Richard Bushman, if anybody knows that name, Richard Bushman says that account is most likely written by Sidney Rigdon or George Robinson, who were scribes of Joseph Smith. It's not his language. It's not the way Joseph wrote things. So we've told one story that's written much later, not in Joseph's writing, and we ignore a story that's much different that comes in 1832. And the trouble is in Mormonism, we stand up and we bear testimony of things. We bear testimony that we know on a spring morning in a grove of trees that Joseph Smith prayed and he was visited by God the Father and his son Jesus, but that's not the 1832 account. But again, we don't know that and here's why. Joseph Fielding Smith was called as church historian in 1921. Sometime between 1921 and 1940, Joseph Fielding Smith cut that 1832 account out of Joseph's personal journal with a penknife and stored it away in a church vault in the church historian's office. And he referred to it as a peculiar first vision and he mentioned it to very few people. He didn't want us to know it. Now, you can go on today and see it because in 1965, Joseph Fielding Smith, the rumor got out, and Gerald and Sandra Tanner, who were critics of the church, started to go public with the fact that there was this other First Vision account. So what does he do? He takes it out of the church vault, he gets some tape, and he tapes it back into Joseph Smith's journal. You can go on LDS.org today and you can look at that 1832 account. It is taped back, back in. You can see the cellophane tape there that places it back into Joseph's journal. The Book of Mormon translation again. We each of us grew up. Stop there for a second, if you want. About Nephite and a spectacle. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, essentially, just two main things. Well, first, I want to say, like, I'm not really reading my outline. I'm I'm looking in their faces. I know the material well enough because I think if I look down and I just read, then I'm going to lose them. So my outline is just kind of data bullet points, and I'll just look up and tell the story. So I'm looking into their eyes. I'm looking around the room and that's intentionally, right? Like when you look at somebody and you have a conversation, they're much more likely to listen and give space for what you're saying. Um, the main things here were just that there are four accounts in the first earliest account, Joseph Smith's 1832 account written by his own hand, his own handwriting in his own personal journal is a very different account from the polished account of 1838, which is not his writing style. It's not his language. It's not his articulation. Um, and for them to understand that and that for them to understand that there are significant differences and then for them to understand the story of Joseph Fielding Smith cutting it out because he himself thought it was a peculiar uh, first vision account. And um, those were the main things I was trying to get across when talking about the first vision. And, and let's, let's include if we can, from, I believe it's the Justice Smith Papers Project, uh, let's include a link, if we can, in our show notes to the 1832 account with the, yeah. with the cellophane tape. If yeah. you can find that bill while we're going, or I, I'll try and find it, or if a listener can find it, I think it'd be interesting. I don't, do you think they've obscured the cellophane tape as a part of the Joseph Smith Papers Project? Uh, no, no. You, the actual images of the 1832 account are accessible, and you can, if you look really closely, zoom in, you can see where it's cut, and you can see the outline of the tape on it. All right. So let's include that for our listeners um, as well. 